Hello everyone, and thank you for coming to my lightning talk. One million protected, six million to go. Lessons learned from banning government face surveillance in Massachusetts. I'm Lauren Chambers. I'm the Technology for Liberty Fellow at the American Civil Liberties Union of Massachusetts, where I use uh, quantitative methods and data analysis to support our legal and legislative advocacy. We wanted to share uh, the results of our um, biggest campaign from the past year, Press Pause on Face Surveillance, where we are trying to uh, achieve municipal, so city and town, as well as ultimately a statewide ban of government use of face surveillance across Massachusetts. So as you can see, we've had great success already. We've actually passed uh, bans in seven cities across Massachusetts in just the past calendar year. So we're really excited about that. And we hope to share some of the lessons that we've learned in this process uh, for those who are hoping to maybe emulate this sort of campaign or else for those who are just curious about how this sort of legislative advocacy process works. So a brief introduction to facial analysis and facial recognition or face surveillance for those who might not be so familiar. Um, facial uh, recognition is uh, one of a number of kinds of facial analysis tools that uh, are used to anal analyze photos and videos of human faces to do a number of things. So facial detection would be to take an image and say whether there is a face within that image, yes or no. Uh, you could have facial, facial classification, which looks at the um, characters, characteristics of that face. So trying to see a face and determine age or gender or other sorts of characteristics. And then recognition is when you have two faces and you're trying to determine if they are uh, from the same person. Uh, the issue with facial recognition is that like many kinds of technology and algorithms, it is subject to biases, particularly along racial and gender lines. Um, so here we have a figure that we put together, um, kind of summarizing the findings of the December 2019 U.S. National Institute of Standards and Technology study that looked at demographic differences between different facial recognition algorithms. So this study was from a third-party government um, kind of auditing organization, uh, and it compared over 90 different facial recognition algorithms and found that the vast majority of them uh, do not work as well for anyone who is not a white man. So what this plot is showing is that the false match rate, which is where two faces who are different people are inaccurately uh, reported as being the same person. The false match rate is higher for black men, black women, and white women for almost all of the algorithms that were tested, uh, and sometimes as high as 10 or even 100 times higher than the false rate match rates for white men. And this is really concerning uh, because facial analysis and facial recognition technology is being used already in the United States and other countries by law enforcement and by the government. So actually just a couple weeks ago, the New York Times ran a story about Robert Williams, who's a man in Detroit, Michigan, who was wrongfully accused by a facial recognition algorithm. He was detained in his front yard in front of his children and kept overnight at the police station. And even when the police revealed to him that uh, the computer had made a mistake and clearly he was not the person they were after, it took a lot of pushing from the ACLU of Michigan to uh, get his story out and get his name clear. And so I think this demonstrates why it's so important to make sure that we're banning this uh, biased and flawed technology and stop our governments from being able to use it to uh, increase the incarceration problem we have in this country. So in that vein, I wanted to share three different kinds of steps that uh, we break down in how to achieve a face surveillance ban. The first step being gathering information. So there's a few ways to go about doing this. One is looking for open source information, what's available on news websites um, and kind of on social media. So you can see if there have been any reporting about facial recognition being adopted by your local police or um, other sort of government agency. You can also look at city spending. So if you know of a particular company that sells facial recognition software, such as Edemia, NEC, or Microsoft, you can look through uh, public budget data for your city or state to try and find any particular contracts with companies like that. Uh, if you happen to have any connections in local government or state government, you can ask those people if they have heard anything about facial recognition being used by government entities. And um, if none of these things work, or if they just don't answer the question you have, you can turn to freedom of information requests 
uh, where you formally file a request with the city or state or whatever government agency uh, in order to answer your question about uh, what's available in the public record as far as facial recognition use. I know that freedom of information laws vary by country, but I do believe that uh, many countries have them, so this is not only a US option. The second part is actually creating the legislation. Um, so we have a lot of things that we've learned uh, through our process of writing various bills for, as we said, over seven towns and cities across Massachusetts, as well as the whole state. First, there are a few things to know before you go. So it's important to understand what is the sort of lawmaking body uh, for the city that you're trying to get the ban passed in. Um, is it a city council? Is it a town meeting? Are you trying to do it in a county government? Who has the balance of power? How does the city council talk to the mayor? Um, those sorts of things. And also, what is the timeline of the legislative session? So are you going to have to go to a couple hearings over a couple months or dozens of meetings with different sorts of subcommittees over even more months? Um, these are important things to understand before you get started. It's also good to have a goal in mind for what flavor of restriction you'd like on facial recognition um, before you go in. So there are, you can request or be pushing for a ban which would be an all out uh, kind of denial, prohibition of using that technology by the government. You could have a moratorium, which is a legally authorized period of delay, so pressing pause on the use of that technology momentarily. Or you can form a commission, which would simply be a group of people who are an oversight committee, sort of, to overlook the use of this sort of technology. And depending on the political landscape where you are and your um, optimism about being able to pass something as strict as a ban, you might want to choose one of these other flavors. And finally, some important must-have language to include in this ban from what we've learned with the various iterations of bills we've looked at. You want, if, you're, if you do choose the ban, you want to be careful about sunset clauses, which effectively turn bans into moratoria, in which the legislation that, if it is passed, would then um, be uh, removed after a certain amount of time. Uh, you want to look out for exceptions that might be written into the bill for certain uh, law enforcement agencies or uses. Uh, you want to make sure to close any loopholes in which municipalities or states might try to use uh, the technology from their neighbors. So if we ban face technology in Boston but not in Cambridge, we can't let the Boston police use it de facto by using going to the Cambridge police and saying, will you run this face for me? Uh, and relatedly, it's important to close the loophole around not just uh, banning and regulating the use and acquisition of this technology, but also regulating and banning the use of data derived from that technology, which kind of is related to the earlier loophole. And then finally, there's the lobbying stage, um, which of course is very important after you have a bill on the books to make sure that there's a lot of public support drummed up for it so that it will be successful. Uh, one important aspect of this is communications. So here at the ACLU of Massachusetts, we have used Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, including posts and ads. We've had appearances on local radio shows. We have written op-eds and had interviews with journalists for local newspapers. Uh, we've written our own blog posts, uh, and we've also used our membership uh, and sent out emails to those sorts of people, all as ways of getting out information as uh, public education about the risks of facial surveillance and uh, again, drumming up support among the public for that. And then once you've done that, you can effectively mobilize your volunteers to do things like signing petitions, writing emails and call making calls to their uh, legislative representatives, senators and representatives, and even ultimately attending and testifying at local and state hearings. So here we actually have an image of uh, the state hearing we had last fall, and you can see the room is packed with all sorts of volunteers who came to support the legislation. And then perhaps most importantly is uh, coalition building. So um, lots of different organizations have skin in the game here, uh, have reason to be concerned about the racial and other social biases that uh, would be heightened with the government use of facial recognition technology. So we personally have paired up with a number of different kinds of coalition organizations, and I'll list some of those here, just the kind of variety. So we have some tech advocacy organizations, general social justice organizations, religious rights groups, immigrants' rights groups, teachers' groups, students' groups, prisoners' rights groups, and criminal defense attorneys, women's groups, and LGBTQIA plus advocacy groups, 
organized labor unions and academics are all sorts of people that you might be able to reach out to and get support for this sort of legislation. And then once you have these coalitions that you have a connection with, um, things that you can ask them to do include signing onto letters to elected officials, mobilizing their members to do things like sign petitions, come to hearings, uh, write emails and call their legislative representatives, uh, and asking them to come testify at uh, legislative hearings, and also to similarly write op-eds and letters to the editor and local papers. So kind of reiterating some of the uh, mobilization and communication techniques uh, I went over earlier. So those are our three points, and we just also wanted to uplift that we are far from the only people doing this sort of work. All of the organizations listed here are also working on uh, some variety of facial recognition ban or restriction in their uh, you know, region of the world. Uh, and so we would encourage you to take a look at what they're up to there. Uh, and also for a written uh, one-pager version of this talk, uh, you can go to data.aclum org slash rightscon2020, uh, where we will have written all of these things up in a handy guide for you to take home.